Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, April 20th, and we are going to be continuing our work on S7, which is a uh, bill relating to expungement and sealing of criminal records. And uh, we have two witnesses today, and uh, I would first like to, to welcome John Campbell, the state's attorney and sheriffs. Good to see you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, for the record, John Campbell, Executive Director of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, we had submitted some written testimony again because James Pepper, who um, has been the legislative liaison, um, is now, uh, he has a gubernatorial appointment and was unable to, uh, to testify. And he had worked his bill up in the Senate. And um, so I am sort of filling in to, um, I guess, to answer a, a few questions that you all might have on one of the sections, I believe section four. And then uh, there's just two other issues that I, I would like to bring up, Madam Chair, if that's you know, just for the uh, committees, um, you know, where they might want to, um, to look into, but um, I can answer or address those first few issues on section four, if you would like. Thank you. It would be very helpful for us to understand um, your position on, on section four. Thank you. And just want to make sure everybody uh, has a language or knows where we are. I'm just looking for a, um, I believe it's on page nine of draft 3.1. Okay, folks uh, are uh, set. Chair, are we looking at the, the uh, amended version 1.2 or the original version 1.1? Um, well, I'm looking at the original one. I'm not, I'm looking at the, uh, let's see. Yeah. Not, are you asking about 1.2 that's dated today? Yeah. Yeah. No. I was just wondering which one we yeah. should be looking at. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John. All right. Okay. Uh, all I have is actually the, uh, the one from the, the official, uh, as passed out by the Senate. So I don't know if there was any change from in that section. Uh, section four from that uh, original bill passed out. Did I don't I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I guess it's been important to point out is that this uh, section applies really to a very narrow area, um, and those are those uh, cases where uh, a person will come forward and ask that their record be expunged or sealed prior to what the expiration date is or that that's prescribed in statute. Generally, it's a five year period. And um, there's just not, there's not a lot of those. And if they, uh, I, again, so what would happen is we're asking here in this uh, amendment that if that does happen, if somebody does want to have um, their record expunged and for us to stipulate to it with the, with the defense um, that it be the prosecution or it be the office that actually prosecuted the case. Uh, now, uh, the reason for this is that uh, the prosecutors or the case themselves, the office, they're the ones that really would have any background knowledge uh, on the individual or the crime uh, any specifics. Uh, generally, the person also is uh, still living in the county um, where the offense occurred and where the initial prosecution occurred. So it would be absolutely beneficial as far as a making sure that we that all of the uh, knowledge of uh, the incident and uh, in making sure that it's it is within the interest of justice. Uh, you want to make sure that the, it's the people who are making that decision are the ones that actually you know, were involved or the office that was involved. Now, there, I know there was a question of, well, is this going to affect the concurrent jurisdiction of the AG? And the answer to that is no. Um, you know, the AG and, and the state's attorney, we still have concurrent jurisdiction, uh, and that would not uh, disturb that, uh, other than in a case where, again, if it was before the five-year period, it would be the initial office that would, um, uh, the, the state attorney's office would be the one to determine whether there should be a stipulation. The other part it does not affect is, uh, and I, I believe there was a question of the uh, expungement clinics. And that's, and that's really a kind of mixed my uh, groups in the prior statement, is what the attorney general was doing a great job uh, along with legal aid uh, in doing these uh, expungement clinics around the state. Uh, it's been great and I think it's worked really well. 
there have been maybe a few cases where uh, there was some uh, some uh, no local knowledge that, that we had to share with the AG that they may not have known, uh, which we did, and uh, but the expungement still went through. And so, so this won't affect this, that at all, the expungement clinics, because they deal with those cases that have already met the eligibility requirements. Um, so, so there really is no issue here. And the, the, other, the other part is when you're dealing with, you know, waiving the statutory timeframes, you're also having an issue, uh, you know, because the victims, which we cannot forget the victims of this, because there's always a victim of the crime. Um, you know, they need to be notified. And uh, a lot of times, you know, victims, these are, you know, could be year, many years out uh, from the initial crime. And so we have to track them down. We have to, to find them. We have to discuss it and explain things to them. And, and again, it's uh, a lot of the local offices. Um, they're the ones that actually have more of a connection with the victims and, and know maybe their families or maybe uh, friends. So it is not only... Um, important to, I think, for justice, but also for the victims themselves to feel that that their case is being, if, if we're going to stipulate to a uh, waiver, that it's being done by their prosecutor, their county. Um, and this really is not too much different than local control, which, you know, used to be a very big thing. And it is still a local control uh, where you're concerned about, um, you know, the people in your community. So I, I think it's, uh, it's something that is, uh, is definitely needed. I don't see this at all uh, interfering with the progression of, the, of this uh, uh, the expansion of the expungements. Um, I think that, that it's gonna be fine. I don't, I don't see there to be any, any issue. That's the first thing you want to, to wait for the questions and then I can go on to the other two issues. That'd be great because um, Barbara's had her hand up. Thank okay. you. Um, thank you, John. Go ahead, sure. Barbara. Thank you. Remember to put my hand down first here. So, so I get that the local um, state attorney is going to have information that the AG's office might not have and that that's important. How can we, though, <clears throat> somehow safeguard against geographic um, enactment of this law. So some prosecutors might just out of pocket not want to okay some and others might take full advantage of this law the way we pass it. Right. So so two things. One, first understand that it's it's before the eligibility period has uh, has expired or has is uh, come to be. So right. that's, that's one. I mean, this, so it's pretty soon right after, uh, I shouldn't say soon, but in general within five years. But what you have to understand also is that there's a kind of a built-in safeguard in that the courts, they can, they can uh, if we don't stipulate, they can take it and then make, have their hearing and make a determination, is this within the interest of justice? So um, I, I think that that safeguard is there. And, you know, the other thing too um, uh, is that, you know, it's interesting when, when the bill first came out, I thought that there would be maybe one or two counties that would be um, reluctant or mm -hmm. that would be questioning some of the uh, uh, expungements. And uh, I was really surprised. And there, there really hasn't been. I mean, Mairead might uh, have different uh, information than, than I have, but I see all of our uh, state's attorneys uh, being on board as far as they understand the need for expungements. There are some things, which again, couple of things I'll tell you right after with this, but where they do have concerns, but generally when you, the initial passing of the expungement laws, the work that you all did um, in the last couple of years, they were supportive. Of and, and I think that, that it's gone, gone very well. And I, uh, you know, uh, Attorney General Donovan has done an incredible job. He's, uh, he's been up there and, and really making sure that along with legal aid that this, this works. Uh, so, uh, I don't think there has been any issues. So I really don't see it going forward, uh, the, you know, under those narrow circumstances being a, being a problem. So, okay, that's helpful because I was going to ask you if it was sort of unanimously supported. Um, so, so the attorney general's office would have jurisdiction for doing their clinics. Yes. But other than that, it would be the state attorneys. Is yes. that right? Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Martin. Uh, thank you, uh, John. I just uh, I just want to make sure I understood uh, uh, your testimony. Um, so you said there it's not affecting a, uh, concurrent jurisdiction with the AG's office, but that is only when um, the individual is eligible for expungement. Is my understanding what you said? So this is a situation where somebody's coming, perhaps in a clinic and they're not eligible yet simply because of the timing issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that narrow circumstance, you know, essentially the AG does not have concurrent jurisdiction uh, with this language. Uh, yeah, they have concurrent jurisdiction once it's deemed eligible, but in this one situation where there's a question of eligibility or waiving that time frame, uh, then it really is only the state's attorneys that can, can decide that issue. For for the waiving of the of the time frame, yes, and okay. um, and the reason again going back is that the we're, our concern is that the uh, the state's attorney is the one with the office with the most knowledge as to sure. the, the the event. So you you know, you're, you'd think you'd want to go with the person who has the the most knowledge of the individual and the crime uh, and you know what subsequent. Uh, actions may have happened, you know, between the, the criminal act and the conviction and the time period that they're talking about. No, I think I, I understand certainly the rationale. I'm just trying to make sure I understand the situation that without this provision in here, uh, there's nothing to prevent the AG to exercise concurrent jurisdiction to say, well, you, you haven't quite met that timing, but I'm going to say that this is fine. But we need to put this in here uh, to, to ensure that it's the state's attorney's that makes that decision. I, I believe you do. And then the, the other uh, state attorneys believe you do, except maybe with the exception of maybe one, one county, one office. All right, so, so it, I, I don't mean to beat this, but I just wanna make very clear. To me, that seems like it, it is in fact, though, taking away some concurrent jurisdiction from the AG in this limited circumstance. And I'm not saying I'm opposed to that one way or another. Uh, I'm just trying to, make sure I understand that right now they have concurrent jurisdiction to make this decision, but this language they would no longer and it would have to go to the state's attorneys. So I just want to make yeah. sure I understood that. Right. And I, I just say that like it's one one aspect or, or one one portion of the jurisdictional question. You know, the jurisdictional question is, you know, who can come in and actually be the respondent and uh, or who can actually you know, put this forward to the to the uh, uh, to the court. And you know, in this case, we're saying that it comes to waiver. We, you know, the the individual state's attorney's office, should be the one uh, that would make that decision. All right. Thanks. Great. Thanks. You're right. Thank you. Any anybody else before John moves on? I'm not seeing yeah. any other hands. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Committee members. Okay, go ahead, John. Thank well, you. Two other issues that I, I think, and I'm not sure if you all have uh, taken this into consideration, and, and I do apologize if I'm uh, repeating what maybe James may have said, um, but I think they're really important, especially when you want to have something succeed, a legislation, and again, as you know, I, I know how this will you know, go forward, and if, you, if we're going to be successful, if you're going to be successful with your policy decision here, you want to make sure that, that all the T's were crossed and I's dotted, of course. Um, one of the biggest things uh, that of concern that I have that I've seen and I've mentioned it uh, you know, uh, into the Senate is number one, the cost involved with this. The, the manpower is, is just going to be um, a significant increase. It's, I think, uh, last year they um, had. The uh, with the fire the prior one, there's like 15 crimes, and there is already a backlog, major backlog with the courts as to just dealing with those. And then this is opening it up to probably, I think, over 700 crimes. I and I can't be precise about that exact number, but and I apologize because I thought I had the note here. Um, however, the uh, the point is, is that for us to be able to, uh, to notify everybody uh, and with all the notification, that is going to be extremely time consuming, um, even though it only takes, let's say some people might say it's only gonna take 10 or 15 minutes, but when you have to, you know, you track them down, you really wanna make sure that you 
actually do make a good faith uh, uh, effort to notify the victims because they really do deserve to be part of, you know, to, to have the, the uh, information. So that, I think that a, a fiscal note should be requested on this thing. I, I just can't imagine it going without a fiscal note. Um, so that's that's number one, because I, I think it's not just us. It's also, I've talked, spoken to um, other departments uh, and I know that they're they're concerned as well. So, but I'm, that's not for me to, to, to testify to. That's right. um, excuse me, John, before you move on. Now, thank you for bringing that up again. And um, that was uh, um, addressed in um, Pepper's um, memo. And we have heard um, testimony to that effect. And, and I do know that the Senate, um, as you said, is is concerned about this. And, um, and um, I know that the Senate and other members of the House are working with Joint Fiscal Office to look at um, some of the, um, the new money coming from the feds to help with the backlog, not only for the state's attorneys, but for the courts. And um, I, I know I asked the, the question, well, should we get a fiscal note? And um, the testimony was, well, we're all, already working on it. You know, JFO is, is, is very aware of it and um, really, you know, really do wanna um, make, make your office and other offices, not sure if we can make you fully whole, but surely um, get on top of that, that backlog. Yeah, I, I just, I guess I was, it became more important in, with the governor's, you know, release as far as what his letter uh, on the uh, uh, H-315, where he was is pretty adamant on the fact that, um, you know, the ARPA funds, you know, are, are going to go to specifically ARPA-related uh, effects. So again, but that's not, that's, now I'm sure the governor is more than capable of coming over and telling you all that itself, uh, or have his office. Right. Well, we, I, for me, I, I strongly believe that the back that the backlog is in part um, due to due to COVID, and so um, so I think it would be very appropriate to help the state's attorneys, courts, and others with with their backlogs, um, not only pertaining to expungement, uh, but to um, but to the functioning of the of the courts and the justice partners um, included. So I will continue to advocate for that. Sure, and understood and, un and understand. Um, the second one is something that, that really does concern me. Um, again, when, when we, um, as legislators, legislators, you, when you are looking at making wholesale change on things, you, uh, you always worry that, are we missing something? And this may be intentional on, on, on the part of, uh, uh, in this policy change, but there are certain crimes that, that in my review the other day of this, because again, I didn't apprehend it earlier, that I was concerned and I'm not sure if you knew that you're actually making eligible for expungement and things like um, you know, possession of child pornography, um, you know, being, uh, you know, not being, that's being eligible for that. And a lot, oftentimes you have cases where, as you know, we've, we've talked about this many times in here, that um, uh, you have, cases that are pled down, there are, the charges are, are more significant, but because of, you know, the problem with the evidence or, uh, or uh, witnesses that are reluctant, uh, especially in violence cases, domestic violence or, or other cases like that. But that is, um, that's one example of there's others, even embezzlement, uh, where, you know, in some cases where, uh, you know, if somebody had embezzled a good deal of money, um, and if that's, you know, then that person can go back into working in, in, in a bank or, or whatever. Now, again, I also know that there is times when there's been uh, many cases that I've seen so far that I like the other bills, but that I think should be expunged, especially when you're dealing with some women who have been in, uh, victims of domestic violence and uh, that they, they have no way out. And they've unfortunately made a bad decision and uh, taken money from their employer. But there are other others though that where there's really um it's a little bit different set of circumstances and that was just a quick i, I just looked for something and th thinking about because you have to go through all of them, uh you know, the crimes to really see are there other ones um that um should not be eligible and when you just say listed crimes we, we know that, uh, that unfortunately there's not uh, you know, that's a list that's kind of grown over, uh, over time. And, and we're now looking at that in the, in the 
uh, Sentencing Commission looking to see what should be uh, considered illicit crime. But but I just wanted you all to know. So if you're making a policy decision, understand that you're making a policy decision to say that a person who had been in possession of child pornography should be eligible for expungement. Again, that's your decision as the policymakers. But I just wanted to make sure that you were aware. Okay, um, I see Martin's hand up. Um, so, John, I don't know if you could um, maybe point us to some of the um, some of the sections. I do know that there were um, sections in the bill that that said um, expunge instead of seal. I'm not sure if if those are some of them, and I'm looking to to Bryn, but um, Martin, maybe you can, or, or Bryn could, could help me out here. Go ahead, Martin. Well, I hope I'm wrong, by the way, but I don't, I don't, I've had a couple of the other state stories just make sure that there's two set of eyes on this. Or yeah. Other sets of eyes on it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Martin, and then also Bryn, if you're here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I, I was going to ask a couple questions just following up on it, it in fact, was uh, one, whether those uh, certain offenses should be sealed instead of expunged. And, you know, so, and, and I don't know the answer to that. But the other question I was going to have is what, what kind of factors would, would you suggest, uh, John, that we look at to de decide what might be sealed, what, what might be expunged, and what we don't make uh, expungement or sealing available at all. Uh, what what are the factors that you would suggest that the committee consider in making those policy decisions? So that's the question for you. I guess the other question is more for Bryn as, as far as, you know, if there are certain crimes that really should only be sealed, but. And, and I think, uh, and it's, it really is a very valid and a, and a good question. I, I, I'm not sure that I can give you any answer other than, you know, my, some of my gut reaction, let's say, with, with uh, possession of child pornography. And again, if I, if I knew that that case had been pled down to that, um, I, you know, there are certain crimes that you, well, we already have certain crimes that are definitely not eligible. And we, um, and it's interesting that some of the crimes that are involved like CDL, like if it's, if it involves a CDL, it's not eligible for expungement or sealing. And we know, cause there's, you know, federal issues there, but there, it, it's just, it would, to me, when I see something, when I, when I, from a visceral standpoint, when I hear, okay, well, it's okay, we're not going to let you expunge a traffic type of offense, but uh, child porn, possession of child pornography, which in my, um, from history of the of cases that I've seen with possession of child porn, uh, th this is one of those cases where, and actually going over to ICAC at the uh, Attorney General's office, I don't think I, I've seen a lot of things in my life, but some of the things that they come across and that they see and some of the child pornography, that, that really just shatters my, my, my faith in humanity sometimes. So I don't want to get um, hyperbolic here, but uh, too much of hyperbole, but uh, I, I just think that if there's one kind of thing like that, there might be others. And I, I just think we should do a, you know, we probably should look at it, or, or you guys should look at it a little, take a deeper dive. But maybe Bryn can answer whether, first of all, whether I'm correct on that. And yeah, thank you. Bryn, are you <laughs> prepared to answer that? Thank you. Sure. Um, so for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. So um, as the committee knows, S7 does make all crimes except for listed crimes and drug trafficking crimes eligible for either sealing or expungement. And um, some of the crimes that are in the sexual exploitation of children chapter, including um, possession of child pornography are not listed crimes. So um, for example, the possession of child pornography is a felony offense. So it would only be eligible for sealing um, pursuant to S7. Um, but yes, it, it would be it would be an eligible crime. Okay, thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you, um, John. That's some of the stuff I had had on my mind from when we went through this uh, bill earlier. Um, you know the um, um, sexual crimes around children and and domestic violence. Um, in in my in my, my opinion, uh, uh, neither one of them should be expunged or sealed. Um, 
I guess, you know, if I wanted to prioritize one, it would, it would definitely be the sexual exploitation things. And, um, and I, I, Madam Chair, can, maybe it's already made available, but do we have a, a list somewhere of all these crimes that, that we could look at? I mean, there, there, and I think John alluded to it. There, there may be some others in there that, um, you know, that, that may um, warrant a, a lot closer look as far as whether uh, they should be expunged or sealed. Um, so so right. Thank I, you. I would so love to be able to get that list. Sure, I'm going to turn to Bryn, who can tell us if we don't have it, how we can get it, and also to confirm that um, these are crimes that are not listed, um, mm -hmm. not listed crimes, and that but they are only eligible for sealing. So, sort of three questions in there. Right. So the so that particular crime um, that Attorney Campbell raised is the is would be eligible for sealing only under S7 because it's a felony offense. Um, and I don't, I don't partic I don't have a list of, of every crime on the books except for the listed crimes and the drug trafficking offenses. Um, I wonder if there's a witness who may have that um, in maybe already made because of the work that this committee and other committees have done on the um, criminal code reclassification bill. Um, in the meantime, you may want to look at the 5301 listed crimes definition to see what that includes, because, for example, the domestic assault crimes are, are listed crimes, so they would not be eligible. Um, but that may be a good place for the committee to start to see what is not included. So if I could real quick, um, uh, Madam Chair, the, the um, Sentencing Commission in the recommendation, I think that's the 2019 December, uh, made recommendations on uh, uh, sex crimes. And so it would have a ready list there. Uh, I'll try to get my hands on it and send it to Evan for, for posting. So people will have that available. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Ken. Hi, good afternoon. I'm just making sure I heard this right. So right now, child porn is in here and it can be sealed that's already there so when you say already there do you mean under the the bill s7 yes it is because the bill makes as i've mentioned all crimes eligible for sealing or expungement except for listed crimes and drug trafficking offenses pursuant to the Sentencing Commission's recommendations in their 2019 report on expungement and sealing. So yes, it is that particular offense is not a listed offense. So it would be eligible for sealing under um, subsection J, which I think is on page 17. So I think I'm with uh, Representative Burdick. I think I need to, uh, to look at that a lot closer because I, I I can't believe that that got by me because I, I think I would have been, uh, well, I'm only one person, but I would have fought that a lot harder. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm confused how I even missed that to begin with because that's, uh, that's a bad one. Thank you. Thank you. And it might, might be good to have the Sentencing Commission, maybe the, uh, the chair of the Sentencing Commission um, back in to help explain why, in fact, um, the commission recommended that these cases uh, be eligible for sealing. Um, um, okay. Madam, yeah, go ahead, John. Just want to be clear, and, and uh, uh, Bryn, no disrespect whatsoever, I just got an email. So there's one of the other essays, evidently, there that are watching currently right now. And I and Bryn, Bryn, maybe you can correct me, but, um, I believe that there is a misdemeanor since a person who violates section 2827 by possessing or accessing with the intent to view a, a photograph, film, or visual depiction, including a depiction of store electronically, with, which constitutes uh, clearly lewd exhibit of child's genitals. And I don't need to go into all the specifics, but that's uh, a misdemeanor. 
So that's in, that's correct. There is a portion of the child pornography statute that's a misdemeanor. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, I just, they asked me to make sure that, that we knew that. So, so I, I think what what happens is that the sentencing commission they basically came and they said, well, what do you what do we want to do? And there was a large um, there was digit of folks that that just feel that you know all crimes should be eligible um, and. Uh, for expungement, and I think that's when they they propose that it's not easy for someone like ledge council to have to you know go through again you look and see which crimes you're going with because again I believe that's listing to list that it would be a huge piece of work I I, I would not I do not envy anybody with having to determine exactly how many crimes you have because as we know also we've got a lot of crimes in the book that don't even make sense anymore we're always you know, have, you know, tripping over some of them and, and deciding why do we even have it on the books and we get rid of them. It's just, um, it's just a, a beast that has continued to grow. Okay. Thank you. And did you have another, another concern or? <laughs> no, I, and I feel bad because I feel like I, I might have just created a uh, um, more, Concern, and I, I apologize. My intent was not to do that, but it's it's just I think it's only fair to, to you all um, to make you aware because I I can tell you if these things happen, they pass, and then, then someone's going, how'd that happen? Um, that's when the fingers start getting pointed. So you know, it's it's what the doing expungements. I think is a great job. I mean, it's important, and I just would hate to. Um, to uh, sideline, you know, the good work that, that the legislature has been doing regarding expungements because of something like this. No, no apologies needed. No, I'm, I'm glad that you raised those concerns and um, glad that, that you're here. That's why I, I had mentioned to you that I, it is important to, to hear this testimony in, in person. And I'd be curious if you have recommendations of how to, um, to address those concerns that you just raised. Uh, okay, Tom. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say no apology. Also, I mean, if there's if there's two things that, in my mind anyway, that deserve to be carved out, it, it is uh, something around uh, domestic violence and 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 definitely you know around the ICAC stuff. So, thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Um, and I don't know about the domestic violence. I think Brendan answered that. So. Okay, uh, not seeing any. Ma Maxine, be, uh, yeah. just something that came before we uh, before we get rid of John, and uh, and I and I have to step out anyway. Uh, um, would this be something worth getting ICAC in here just to uh, see what their opinion is on it? Get a little testimony from them. Right. Let me think. Let me think about that. I mean, we, we're okay. sure you're familiar with their with their work, and certainly their work is one that we've supported. I think it goes more to the sentencing commission how we classify our crimes, um, right? By our misdemeanors versus our felonies, and um, and what the sentencing commission was. Um, I don't want to say what were they thinking, but what they were, you know. Um, what analysis went into their to their recommendations? Because certainly that's a quite a diverse group um, who are very familiar with with the laws from various different whether it's as prosecutors, judges, defense attorneys. Um, so I, I think that's where I would go back and and revisit uh, for starters, along with um, legislative council. But let's keep thinking about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, any um, other questions before, before we move on to our next witness? Um, sure, Martin, go ahead. Um, and oh, Tom, Tom, did you have something else or? Yeah, okay, Martin. So, so I wonder if I can uh, ask uh, John to comment on the proposed uh, language amendment on section four that that I had uh, asked Bryn to put together and was was posted. Uh, John, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. And the idea generally is 
the language in, in section four that we were talking about earlier absolutely prohibits the AG from making the decision on eligibility if, uh, if the time frame hasn't uh, expired uh, and what this language would do. And it's, not, it's been posted, so if, if folks want to look at it, uh, simply what it would do is it would allow the state's attorney that would have that jurisdiction to essentially allow, you know, to waive having to make that decision. So if there, if there was, it, it'll, right now it really completely bans the AG in, in one of these uh, clinics to, to make that decision. Uh, but this would give a little flexibility where the state's attorney couldn't come to some sort of agreement with the AG to say, yeah, within these confines, yeah, you can go ahead and make that decision. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that language or if you have any comments on that. I have, um, I have, I mean, I'm sorry, I have not. Um, so I'll, I'll take a look at that right away and see if I can get back and, and maybe come back on uh, while Mairead is testifying uh, afterwards. But um, the only thing that would concern me is the fact that the, the only time this really comes relevant is that when we wouldn't waive uh, the time, the eligibility, and the only reason they wouldn't waive the eligibility would be, you know, again, you, there's some knowledge that, is saying some reason that's saying that this, this is not going to be a smart thing for us to to waive um, again the, and because of the time period on I don't know but I, I I'll take a look at the language let's just say that and then I'll give you a, a check with a couple of folks all right thanks all right yeah, thanks. And actually John I want to go back to something that um, make sure I understood you um, did you say that in terms of the clinics um, that those clinics um, only pertain to people who are eligible. The time frame is um, has expired, so that this might not come up at, during the clinics. And I, I realize maybe Marie, can, our next witness, can can yeah. answer this as, at, as my, well. My understanding. Well, first of all, the clinics are are for the ones that um, uh, have where the eligibility requirements have all been met. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that somebody would come to one of the clinics and and, and file this and and you know realize that uh, I'm sorry the time has not or they they don't meet all the eligibility requirements. But I I would defer to Mairead on that because she probably does know how often that's happened. Okay, great, thank you, Martin. You're good. No, okay, all right, okay. Well, thank you. So as a Great segue into our next um, witness, Mireille O'Reilly from Vermont Legal Aid. Welcome and good to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, for the record, I am Mireille O'Reilly from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, I just want to start by thanking the committee for uh, your years of work on this issue and uh, even on this bill. Um, as you know, for the last several years, we have been the organization primarily responsible for working with petitioners to file for expungement or sealing relief with the court and in conjunction with the uh, state's attorney and attorney general's office. Um, our testimony and perspective is informed directly by our work with Vermonters who have accessed and are seeking access for this relief. Um, we've worked with thousands of Vermonters and uh, strongly believe that this is going to have a significant impact on the lives and livelihoods and well being of so many low income Vermonters seeking uh, record clearance. Um, off the top of my head, I can think of dozens of clients who are waiting for this bill to pass uh, so that they can move on with their lives and, and uh, obtain more uh, suitable employment. Um, and it's our perspective that the legislature is doing the right thing by furthering expungement reform. Um, I have one substantive comment on the bill um, and a few responses to um, different statements made by legislators and witnesses over the last couple of weeks. And I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Um, the first, uh, comment that I have is a minor technical amendment to uh, the surcharge provision that's included in S7. Um, so as you all know, S7 includes a technical fix to the surcharge language that was actually passed last year through Act 167 um, in order to effectuate that legislation. There's been some uh, concern across different courts um, that have uh, you know, struggled with with the language as passed. So the, the fix in S7 um, 
to 13 VSA 7282 will be very helpful. Um, I have one minor recommendation, uh, which would be to include um, the language that was in Act 167. And that language reads, um, any restitution and surcharge ordered by the court had been paid in full, provided that payment of the surcharge shall not be required if the surcharges have been waived. Um, the recommendation would be to include that language in a few additional provisions uh, within 13 VSA 7602. Um, and I can give you the lines and the page numbers um, on the most recent version of the bill that Bryn posted today, if that would be helpful. Um, but just sort of to give you a little bit more explanation of that uh, proposed recommendation. Um, so as you know, S7 creates several new categories of crimes in, in 7602, um, non-predicate misdemeanor, predicate misdemeanor, felony property crimes, and other felony offenses. Several of those sections include that surcharge waiver language that was um, drafted and, and passed through Act 167, but several of the sections um, do not actually include that waiver provision. So for any category of prime that doesn't include the waiver language, I think there would be a viable argument to say that waiver of surcharge would not be available for that type of crime. I don't think that the legislature in, intends to do that. Um, I haven't heard any conversation that certain types of crimes, um, certain types of convictions should not be eligible for a surcharge waiver. And you know, I would also recommend if, if that were the perspective um, of the committee that, that we move away from that. Um, and I think the fix is easy. It's just to sort of copy paste that same language. Um, and one example of where you can find it is uh, page 12, line one um, in, in several different uh, provisions in the bill. And I can sort of give those sites, but it's 7602 subsection A, subsection G, subsection H, subsection I, and subsection J. Um, just to make sure that uh, waiver of surcharge is uniformly accessible uh, for petitions to seal or expunge um, any type of conviction. Um, so I can stop there and see if folks have questions. No. no um, okay. Thank you. I, I I would like to know if, if it just was if it was inadvertent or if it had been discussed in the Senate or yeah I, and just you know for what it's worth I as this is a provision that's near and dear to legal aid I didn't hear anything um, I could have missed something but I I certainly would you know at least acknowledge if I had been part of a conversation and there was a a debate I think it was just inadvertent but um, others can can speak to that. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next uh, comment that I had was um, related to a different type of legal financial obligation. Um, at some point over the last couple of weeks, I'm, I'm forgetting which day, but Representative Lalonde had inquired um, during a committee hearing about whether the committee might consider fine waivers and, and also just wondered aloud whether fines um, like surcharges are a barrier to expungement. Um, and I, I don't know if, um, you know, the committee came to a conclusion about whether to act on that uh, or pursue that any further, um, but I just wanted to sort of give my two cents. Um, so Legal Aid has not collected any data about barriers posed by this particular type of legal financial obligation, but I can say that anecdotally um, in our casework over the last four plus years, fines have been a barrier. Uh, to expungement for low-income Vermonters, um, especially for those who are convicted of lower-level quality-of-life offenses, so the ones in particular um, where I see fines coming up, um, and somewhat substantial fines have been marijuana possession cases, um, as well as uh, your, you know, disorderly conduct type offenses. Um, surcharges are, you know, for obvious reasons, a more significant barrier because they are assessed in every conviction, and um, the language that's going to be amended in this bill has prevented uh, the waiver of surcharges. While fines um, are not always assessed and can, there's an argument they can be suspended. Um, but, you know, we have seen this issue and I think just as a rule, uh, legal financial obligations are going uh, to prevent um, 
low income Vermonters from accessing this remedy. Um, so wherever they're a precondition to expungement, um, low income Vermonters are going to um, come up against that and, and uh, struggle. Um, if the committee wanted to address this in S7, um, you know, I have a um, recommendation, which would just be to sort of include a waiver of fines provision in 13 VSA 7178, similar to the one um, related to surcharges that's going into 7282. Um, but if the committee, you know, feels that it's a, a bit too late in the game to tackle this sort of substantive change, I, I think that the issue um, would logically be um, considered by the Sentencing Commission um, as they look to uh, work on simplifying and automating the system. Um, because I think, you know, as, as I think this committee grappled with last year with the um, automating of marijuana expungements, the legal financial obligation piece is, is going to have to be considered and um, sort of legislated around. So it'll certainly come up if it doesn't, you know, if it's not something that makes sense to amend now. I'll thank, no, I thank you. That's appreciated. That, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we had her testimony um, stating that it wasn't as much of an issue, but I really appreciate your, your testimony um, for sure. Yeah. And suggestions. It's always helpful. <laughs> uh, that, not seeing any hands. Okay. So keep going. Thank sure. You. Um, so I just wanted to briefly um, comment on the um, section four proposal by the state's attorney that passed out of the Senate um, regarding the attorney general's office concurrent jurisdiction when it comes to um, expungement. Um, and, you know, admittedly, I'm, I'm not a prosecutor. And so um, I can't speak exactly to um, John Campbell's uh, sort of nuancing of, of whether it's still concurrent jurisdiction or not. Um, but I will just say that, you know, from my perspective, um, it is a, a part of concurrent jurisdiction. Um, and it does seem to make good sense for the AGO to retain concurrent jurisdiction um, over cases at the expungement stage. And I, I haven't seen this um, as a problem requiring any sort of legislative fix. Um, because of the way the current law is drafted, um, the AGOs have the ability to um, stipulate to the expungement um, of criminal records during our um, clinics with the attorney general's office. Um, and I've always sort of assumed that this might be helpful to the state's attorneys because it, um, I think it takes some work off of their um, busy dockets. Um, I don't think there's any countervailing risk to maintaining the status quo here, um, because in my experience, uh, the folks at the attorney general's office who have the authority to stipulate, um, uh, they don't do so without getting prior permission, again, in my experience, from the state's attorney's office. Um, I do think, too, that maintaining this status quo you know, allowing for concurrent ju jurisdiction for both prosecution and the restoration um, through expungement sends the right message about Vermont's policy priorities and our commitment to restorative justice. Um, so if our state's lead law enforcement officer can, um, you know, has the authority to prosecute, um, I think having the full ability to restore people back to the community um, is also a power um, that they should maintain. Um, I just, in response to um, John Campbell's comments, you know, part of the efficiencies of the clinic is uh, folks come in and sometimes they don't quite meet the eligibility uh, timeline. So for Vermont Legal Aid and the Attorney General's Office to be able to sit down and that same day sort of assess um, what's eligible and stipulate um, or stipulate around um, some of the timelines, while it doesn't happen with incredible frequency, um, it is a benefit, right? Everyone is in the room on the same day. We can sort of get um, a stack of, of these um, petitions over to the court. Um, and, you know, most importantly, uh, it's an efficiency for the petitioner who doesn't have to, um, you know, go chasing um, a state's attorney who, um, you know, might might be incredibly busy and might just have one day designated um, for expungements out of a whole month or um, every two months. So 
um, it's an access to justice issue. I think it sends the right message. I really haven't seen, um, you know, anything that seems concerning. Um, and while this isn't regular practice, uh, technically the AG could stipulate around the timeline um, if that seemed appropriate. And I would trust just, you know, knowing who's um, in the office, um, I would trust that, you know, any victim input that could be um, ascertained by the state's attorney would, uh, and could be ascertained by by the attorney general's office as well. Um, so that's sort of my perspective on that. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I do. I did take a peek at uh, Representative Lalonde's amendment, and I, you know, I think that's a fair compromise. Um, but again, I, I don't, I haven't seen this as an issue, and I wouldn't think that it's. Um, you know, something we would um, want to as a state sort of take that discretion away from the attorney general only when it comes to restoration. I think that sort of moves us um, in a direction that um, doesn't seem very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I can just speak, um, I guess, Similarly to the Department of Corrections um, concern about expungements uh, occurring when individuals are under supervision. Um, and just sort of as a preliminary point, um, Vermont Legal Aid's position uh, aligns with that of the AGO that um, records have a, a definite predictive value um, and use of very old records in risk assessments um, wouldn't be supported by the data. So. Um, you know, expungement of old records, you know, perhaps shouldn't even be part of a risk assessment. And um, I'm not well versed enough in, in the risk assessments that the Vermont Department of Correction uses to know whether they're looking at very old records. Um, but I would say um, it would be hard for me to imagine a situation where someone under supervision was getting anything but incredibly old records uh, expunged. Um, and I, the only other point I want to make on this is that, um, it's important to consider that the only way a person under supervision would be able to get an expungement is if the state's attorney stipulates. Um, and this is our local elected uh, law enforcement officer official. Um, and so their stipulation to an expungement um, indicates that they believe at the very least public safety would not be harmed by the expungement. And at most public safety um, might actually benefit from the person getting an expungement. Um, you know, they use everything at their disposal in order to make these assessments, uh, including conversations with the victim, uh, with a petitioner, with a petitioner's advocate, if they have one, um, as well as, you know, information from the Department of Corrections um, and, and their own records um, from the underlying cases. So I would trust that if they're uh, determining that a person um, can have some old records expunged while they're on supervision. They're not um, making that decision lightly um, and that they're, you know, really sort of investigating whether it would be in the best interest um, and in the, the public safety interest of their community. Um, and I think just the last comment I had was a, um, responsive to the Department of Public Safety's testimony about moving to a ceiling only system. Um, I think he had concerns about the wisdom of expunging records um, and stated that it, you know, it could frustrate another policy goal, which is police accountability. Um, and you know, as um, David Shear from the Attorney General's office mentioned, this is, um, will be addressed by the Sentence Commission over the interim. Um, and, you know, Legal Aid will hopefully, you know, participate in some way in those conversations despite not being a member. Um, but I, I'll just say that, um, you know, in our experience, this has never been an issue for our clients. Um, and as a matter of course, counsel um, for expungement petitioners regularly hear about the underlying um, arrest, charge, and conviction experience of folks, especially when it's been traumatic. 
Um, and so I have on several occasions um, sort of paused the process and referred folks to um, the ACLU and defense attorneys to investigate the merits of a use of force or brutality case. Um, similarly, I imagine that defense counsel in the initial case um, would, you know, similarly hear about um, any brutality that occurred or any sort of misconduct that occurred and, you know, advise that defendant accordingly before the record is gone. Um, you know, I, I think this is an issue that'll be taken up next year, but um, I, as a sort of preview for our perspective, um, access to sealed records, um, you know, if we were to move to a sealing only regime, I think our biggest concern is that access to sealed records um, needs to be less expansive and more time limited, um, especially for law enforcement actors. Um, you know, if this is to become the, the sole remedy available to petitioners. Um, and, you know, there would need to be a sort of a, a clearer delineation of who gets access um, for how long, and then some real accountability codified into law for any wrongful use of sealed records. Um, you know, and the primary concern there being that um, we wouldn't want um, very old sealed records to be used uh, by law enforcement in, um, you know, street patrol and decisions to stop and search uh, individuals. Um, and, and I think that, you know, those are discussions that'll happen um, during the interim. Um, and, you know, as I said, we hope to participate in them. Um, so that's really all I have, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, again, I just want to thank you all. I know that every session you hear about this and take testimony and um, you're patient and thoughtful and creative and um, a lot of people are benefiting. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. Thank you. I'm getting in the hand, how, happy to put my hand down. So I, I am concerned about the fees too. And um, if we wait to, for the sentencing commission to address it, I don't know if, it, how, right. I don't know how many people would, would um, be affected by this. And I don't know if you have like rough percentages of, you know, from your time doing these. And, and you were talking about the fines in particular. Right. Yeah. So, no, I mean, off the top, like obviously 100% of people are impacted by the surcharge issue. And, you know, right. anecdotally, I could just guess. And I think it would be, you know, under under 10%. And again, it's, it's mostly with those marijuana cases um, and the lower level disorderly conduct. Um, there have been you know, some courts who are willing to suspend the fines um, because, you know, there's a plausible argument to be made that they, they can be suspended. And, um, right. but, you know, that's sort of, it requires a whole other petition um, and, you know, really a sort of luck of the draw. Um, and it would just be better to be able to get, you know, a very comprehensive but simple statement that says, you know, these can be waived if the person can't pay you know, right. just the same way that we have um, drafted an S7 for the surcharge. Right. So I don't think it would be a, a huge, okay, a huge, huge problem, but obviously, I mean, if it, if it feels like it's something that could, you know, move and wouldn't hold up the bill, I think it, um, it's always going to be helpful to low-income people to take care of the, right. those financial obligations. Yeah. And it sounds like you've been watching all the testimony um, so we were hearing um, uh, from public safety their concerns that it would be better for people if their records were sealed. And I'm wondering, have you ever had a client who it would have been in their self-interest to have had their records sealed instead of expunged? Um, at this time, no. I mean, there are immigration concerns. And when, you know, we, we do some screening for immigration concerns. And so if, you know, a person was not born in the United States, sort of our first course of action is to have them consult with an immigration attorney down at the South Royalton Legal Clinic to ensure, um, you know, 
we don't ex inadvertently uh, or um, we don't create a, an additional collateral consequence or um, to to the expungement process. Um, you know, they might need to defend against some allegation in a, an immigration proceeding, and they would need to have certified copies of those records. Um, so that would be the context in which it comes up, and we do our very best to um, advise. Um, you know, I I will say that I, I could imagine um, a situation where if there were no eyewitnesses um, and there was a, you know, a, uh, an instance of police brutality and, and body cam footage was deleted, that, that would be a concern. Um, and as I said, um, for better or worse, we hear an awful lot about the underlying uh, arrests, charges, conviction, incarceration. Um, so things are, you know, any attorney who's counseling these individuals, like light bulbs are going to be going off. Um, and, and as I said, um, I have on a couple of occasions paused people and just said, I, I think you should have a conversation with the ACLU because it sounds like, you know, you might want to work on addressing um, and, and investigating whether you have an actual uh, civil rights claim. Um, so we have paused those. And I, I could imagine, you know, if we were to move to a, a system where we're automatically expunging everything after two or three years, I think that would be very concerning. But I don't, you know, my sense is that um, we're not moving in that direction. And <laughs> not that um, quickly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right, because the statute of limitations, I think, is three years for many of those civil cases, um, which is, you know, a much shorter timeline than even uh, ceiling under S seven. Um, so I don't, I don't see it as a, um, particularly big concern. I could fathom a reality in which that would be a concern, but again, I think there are just so many actors in the system who are, um, interfacing with these folks first when they're defendants and then when they're expungement petitioners, um, that these things are, um, these concerns are being addressed and they're, and, um, you know, these folks are, are getting counsel for the actual civil rights cases that they may have. I, I think you might have raised uh, sort of other examples, but that was the one that popped out at me. Okay. And um, I mean, you mentioned law enforcement having access, which they would have access, right? Because it's part of their system. Um, but others could subpoena, like when they exist in, in a sealed file, I'm just wondering who else could access them that might that it might um, wipe out the intent we have of ex expungement, but doing the sealing version of it, like yeah. a landlord, a, an employer. No, a, I, I I think um, I think sealing uh, sort of. I think sealing really uh, is effective when it comes to um, housing and employment. Um, I, I, I really do think it's protective enough. The, the thing that's um, really concerning is, um, you know, if someone stays on law enforcement's radar for mm -hmm. too long and those records become sort of a pretext or a justification to keep them engaged in the system, that has employment consequences, right? Because every time someone starts to reintegrate and, and get their feet under them again, um, they're, you know, it's getting gained. caught back up into the system. So our concern would be, um, can we narrow the definition? Can we ensure that um, after, you know, a set period of time, certain actors in the system, you know, are going to lose access to those records so that mm -hmm. in effect, even if the case isn't ultimately uh, destroyed, um, in effect, you know, the only person who has access to it is, you know, folks who are doing data and the petitioner themselves um, at right. some point. Right. Because again, I know Commissioner Sherling kept talking about predicate crimes, but the idea is, wait, we, if they wouldn't, we know that. And, you know, if we're passing expungement where they're getting a clean slate, so it shouldn't be a predicate, but. Yeah, I mean, I think that the ceiling under like the DUI offense, for example, those are still permitted to be a predicate 
you know, to be counted as predicate offenses for a certain period of time. I right. would just hope, and I, I, you know, would trust the committees that um, there would be a, you know, a data-driven um, decision about, you know, how long those sealed offenses can be used as predicates, so that we're not just sort of, um, yeah, permitting these to be used uh, into perpetuity for, um, sen- you know, subsequent sentencing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to go back to the very first issue that you were discussing with us, uh, Mare. Uh, the language regarding surcharges. Yes. I just want to make sure I understood that. So I'm looking at the bill as passed the Senate in okay. uh, the bottom of page 11. Uh, it has that language I think that you mentioned, mm-hmm. as any restitution surcharges ordered by the court have been paid in full provided that payment of surcharges shall not be required if the surcharges have been waived by the court pursuant to section 7D282 of this title. Yes. So you, you just think that that language needs to be also in other places. I just wanted to clarify. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. And I, unfortunately, in my notes, I sort of marked out the, the bill um, with your most recent amendments that Bryn drafted, but I can tell you, um, I can tell you which sections I think it needs to be added in or where it's omitted, and I believe inadvertently, um, and those sections are, um, so the first one is 7602 subsection A, which is just kind of the, you know, the prior version of, um, you know, permitting the state's attorney and, and the petitioner to stipulate around the time frames. Um, the second one is 7602G. Right. Wait, wait, um, wait, 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 sure. Wait. So 7602A A. has multiple you know there's a1 a2 yeah exactly so it would just be a number six i believe because i think we're all the way down to five um maybe which, just, if you could email that and copy yeah absolutely and, yeah and, and then, you know rather than trying to do it over so so we make absolutely sure know what you're talking about that that was my my main question sure and the other question has to do with what you were just talking about and, and is it your is it your view that it's this is, this is probably a rhetorical question, but I'll, I'll throw it out there anyway, uh, that for certain crimes, it's more important that we get to the point of sealing than to the end game of, of destroying the records. You know, that, that sealing is, is giving us a lot of what we're after. Yeah, I, I would say um, a qualified yes. Um, I think if we can ensure that no one, um, if we can ensure that these records are not being used to, um, you know, as I said, inform stops and searches on the street, sure. like that's that's really my biggest concern. Um, so it depend, depends on how tight the seal is, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, we've talked, um, I think the language that the attorney general's office has started using is, you know, a certain level of con confidentiality descends upon the record. And so, you know, for a period of time, a seal means, um, you know, only the public is is barred from access, but, you know, criminal justice agencies as, as they are currently now under the sealing law um, permitted access. And then, you know, that winnows down to a certain subset of criminal justice agencies for a certain, uh, you know, criminal justice offense. Um, and it and it keeps narrowing until you know essentially sure the court has it and sure the petitioner can petition for access but otherwise it's gone. All right, thank you. Uh, Bob. Yes, thank you. Hi, Mir- Mirad. Hi. I don't forget your name right. Uh, thanks for being here. Maybe uh, this all seems to be a little confusing to me. I'm looking at the the uh, the concern for the surcharges and so on and so forth, and under uh, section 7282, it reads that the uh, the surcharges imposed by the section shall not be waived by the court except as part of an expungement or sealing where the petitioner demonstrates his or her inability to pay. Maybe maybe you could explain that to me a little bit. And through your experience, and I have one more quick question, but through your experience. Uh, what other search areas, cost-wise, value-wise, what have they been? 
sorry, I have a question about your very last question. Um, what other surcharges? I just didn't quite hear you. The <clears throat> when, when we're talking about surcharges, what are we talking about generally speaking? Ten dollars, a hundred dollars. Oh, gotcha. The amount. Um, yes. So the surcharges that are assessed for every conviction are based on statutory schedule, and I right now my. Um, recollection is that it's at $147 per conviction. So if you have a multi-count case, let's say two, um, two or three convictions, it's 147 times three. I'm terrible at math, but um, I think you, yeah, get the idea. Um, so those are the amounts per, um, for every surcharge. And um, I'll try to answer your first question. Um, so I, I think the amendment included in S7 is going to fix the problem um, that we've had since Act 167 has passed. Um, so Act 167 um, provided that um, any restitution and surcharges ordered by the court um, ha must have been paid in full, provided that payment of surcharges shall not be required if the surcharges have been waived by the court pursuant to section 7282. So the problem that courts found since Act 167 was passed is that 7282 still said surcharges shall not be waived. So this amendment um, is going to fix that problem. But something that I noticed uh, very recently is that um, there are a number of additional provisions um, in 13 BSA 7602 that don't include um, the language that was in Act 167. And I worry that the provisions that omit that language um, will be interpreted by courts as not um, allowing for waiver of surcharge for those particular types of crimes. So for example, in the felony property crime subsection of the statute, um, that just, um, the rather than saying surcharges may be waived, it just has a requirement that restitution be paid prior to the expungement. And I worry that um, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm working with the attorney general's office and we're getting a felony property crime that's 15 years old expunged and it has a surcharge of $147, we ask for a waiver, the court's gonna look to um, that section of the law and say, but this section of the law doesn't allow me to waive surcharges. Um, so I just wanted to sort of make sure that all of those provisions for every category of crime was explicit about uh, the ability for courts to waive those surcharges. And as I mentioned, I don't, I, I think that was um, an accidental omission. Does that make sense? Yes. And you also stated that uh, it was 10% or less where it actually became a financial burden for individuals. So I'm, I was just sort of guessing at, um, I, was speak, I was responding to Representative Rachelson's question about fines, which are different from surcharges. So surcharges are automatically assessed by the court in every single conviction, whereas fines are just a part of the sentence um, that a court orders, that the judge orders. Um, so not every case has a fine. Um, Representative Lalonde had mentioned earlier in uh, testimony over the past couple of weeks, he wondered if a waiver of search of, um, he wondered if the committee should tackle uh, waiving fines as well as surcharges. You know, there are different sort of financial barrier. Um, and he wondered whether they were, um, you know, still posing issue for Vermonters. And, you know, my response is, Every time they're assessed to a very low income person, um, they're going to you know, be a barrier to expungement if they're seen as a precondition. But you know, I, I don't think that they're not assessed, uh, they're not ordered by the court uniformly. So I was sort of guessing, um, which I shouldn't do on record. So I apologize, but it's a, it's a far uh, smaller group of, of people who are contending with the fine barrier as opposed to the surcharge barrier. So I, I'm, I'm pleased that the committee is uh, addressing the surcharge issue. Um, I think if we had to wait to address the fines until next year, um, that would be okay. But if it's something that's uh, you know, doable now, that I think there's an easy fix. Okay, and, and Sarah, there's no need to apologize. Uh, and lastly, you had made uh, uh, the, the statement when it referred to the sealing of records you were speaking to Representative Richardson in reference to law enforcement having access to these records, and you stated that if they uh, 
if they remained on law enforcement's radar for whatever reason, uh, so and so forth. Could you, through your experiences, give me an example of that, what we're referring to here? Um, so my concern um, is that if law enforcement um, had access to sealed records into perpetuity, they might be, um, they, you know, they could possibly use an old stale sealed record as, um, you know, a, a justification for, um, you know, continued uh, involvement with that person. Um, you know, there was a lawsuit out of New York City um, where law enforcement um, had access to sealed records um, that had been, so dismissed records that were sealed uh, in their handheld device and were unlawfully using those sealed records to apprehend, uh, to stop and search and apprehend um, folks who had prior involvement. And my concern is that um, we wouldn't want to create a system where um, into perpetuity, those those records would be accessible to law enforcement who are, um, you know, investigating for new crimes. Um, we would want there to be, you know, some limitation to um, the amount of time for which they can actually use those. I, and I appreciate that. <clears throat> and my last uh, question is, through your own personal experience within the state of Vermont, are you aware of this ever happening? Um. At this moment, no. I think there there are probably other witnesses who could speak to this more. Um, I would imagine uh, folks from the Defender General's office would be the best witnesses to testify about that. Thank you very much. Uh, Ken, I saw your hand up and now it's damaged. I want to make sure that your questions were answered or? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um... Bob asked the questions and they got uh, answered and I'm all set, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Not seeing any other hands, okay. Great, thank you. Any Anything else or that you wanna leave us with? No, just uh, my gratitude for all of your work on this. Again, um, I'm, Grateful uh, for House Judiciary Committee and, and Senate Judici Judiciary Committee and, and uh, all your interest and work on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, before we take our break, I just wanna uh, give John Campbell an opportunity if if he wants it <laughs> to come back on, but yeah, no I'll, pressure. I'll, yeah. I'll just make it quick and, and uh, I did get a chance to read uh, the amendment, and I, I'm not sure it really does anything. I, I would think that if somebody wants to waive, if a, if a state's attorney wants to waive, that uh, he would waive the time period themselves. But I, again, I just kind of you know go back to the fact that the you know, the state's attorneys are in the best position to to really know uh, whether or not a, a waiver a waiver period um, should occur. Again, during the or during, when I was when Maureen was testifying, I talked to Rory uh, Tebow. I just asked him, and he told me he had had one individual who came um, and actually was from one of the clinics, and they uh, was he was trying to get uh, the expungement uh, just very shortly after his um, probationary period, and but Rory had, and the person didn't know whoever it was from the AG's office that. That the person had been had violated probation a couple of times, and and so he he said, no, we're not going to waive the period. This person needs more time. Um, so there are we again, it comes down to the fact that that we um, do our off our state attorneys do have that specific knowledge that really is important and essential to make these decisions. Or and really, I guess it comes down to is are these statutory time frames, uh, time period, waiting periods. Are they important? Uh, are, are they there for a reason? And um, if they are, then they should be the ones that, the, in order to, to waive them, the decision should be made by, again, the office that, that prosecutes them. So thank you again for letting us testify. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John. Um, see Martin's hand is up and, uh, and Ken. Yeah, I want a, a follow-up question. Maybe, the, maybe we've used the the wrong language in this this amendment. Um, I, I mean, I'm 
I, I'm suggesting, you know, I'm not suggesting that the AG have carte blanche to, to waive uh, that eligibility requirement. Um, only, only that it gives the state's attorney, if it so wishes, to let the AG make that decision. Uh, it doesn't have to. And I think the language without this uh, sentence, and maybe uh, instead of saying the office that prosecuted the offense may waive this requirement, we could instead say the office that prosecuted the offense may delegate uh, the decision on whether to waive the eligibility requirement to, the, to another prosecutor. But the point is, I don't think that you can, I don't think that a state's attorney can uh, delegate that authority to the AG under the language that we have in this provision. And I think that this language would at least allow a state's attorney to do so if they so desire. They don't, of course, have to. And respectfully, I, I disagree because I think, again, we're not the concurrent, they have the concurrent jurisdiction. They have all the authority uh, that, that the state's attorney does. But what, what this amendment is saying is that, however, if it's th in those small, narrow band of cases where um, someone is asking to have the time frame uh, waived, the eligibility time frame waived, then it, the only person that can make that decision uh, is the state's attorney. Or if he wants to just uh, not object, then he won't object. Or if the state or the AG says, hey, look, we've got this, this, this case, we're handling it, we've been following it, um, do you have an objection? And I'm sure, and if he says, no, I don't have an objection, then it just goes on. And, uh, you know, I think, I think that they can uh, waive it at that point. So, so the AG would just have to go to the state's attorney if they are in a, one of these clinics and one of these things comes up, would have to get the sign off essentially in the state's attorney. That's, that's the way I, I see it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ken. Hi, John. Um, going, going back to um, Bob's question and, and what I was going to ask, the um, the individuals that have been a, accused of a crime or or have been convicted of a crime, um, I'm I'm looking for data. Do you have that data to to where they've been? Um, I. I don't know the correct words to, to, to put into um, that they're being, um, all I can think of is picked on unnecessarily, that, that they're being watched too closely, that they're being stopped unnecessarily or harassed or something like that. Is, is there records like that in your department? Um, no, I, I would imagine if there, if there was any complaints for, are you saying like because of a person's past records or the fact is our, our you know, law, is law enforcement keeping an eye on, let's say, Joe Smith because he's done, an, we know he's, he's, he's done uh, X burglary, like 20 burglaries in, in the area. Um, is that what you're talking about? Or? Well, yeah, but I mean, I mean, if he's if he's got twenty burglaries uh, in the area, I mean, he's he's obviously going to be stopped. But I'm I'm going to be saying for for a small, um, I don't know, he, he was jaywalking or he was uh, riding a bicycle and he and he swerved or uh, and and you know they think he's a DUI or something like that. I mean. It, do we have a lot of, uh, I, I guess another word would be a harassment thing where we're picking on somebody that's that's already been convicted unnecessarily? Well, let me just say this. If law enforcement, if there's a law enforcement officer that's doing that, um, I think a complaint should absolutely be filed against the law enforcement officer. I, you know, I think that if a person has, you know, committed a crime, they've served their time, they've done their time, um, then that's, they're back to, to square one. They've, they've answered their, um, uh, again, served their time. And, and uh, but if it's, if it's, and even if it's something where, um, I don't know, I, again, I, I'm not sure if you're asking post conviction or not. I don't want to get into a rabbit hole, down a rabbit hole. But let's just say that, that those, you know, uh, if a officer is doing that, then I would advise, uh, in fact, actually, I have advised in the, in, as recently as about uh, a year ago of the person who was claiming that he was being harassed by one certain officer. I said, you need to bring it to the attention of, of the chief. 
Um, and the chief has to do under, um, I forget what, is, what the act is, but has to do an internal affairs uh, complaint on, or investigation on that. So again, I'm not sure if I'm going, if that's answering your question or if we're going into another area totally. Maybe Bob, because uh, I was, when, when Murray was, I, went, I may have missed the initial question because I was on the phone with, uh, with our uh, Washington County State's attorney asking him a question. So I apologize for that. No, I, I, you answered my question. I was just following up with Bob's. I mean, if Bob can ask it again better than, than what I did, but I, I think it's been answered. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anybody else before we take a break? Okay. okay. Not seeing any hands. Um, so committee, I'm going to take a little bit of a longer break than, um, than we usually do. I'd like to come back at 3.15 and a half an hour, and then we'll just uh, um, meet briefly so I can look at the at the week ahead um, with you and um, and talk about some of our bills that we should be watching coming over from from the Senate. Uh, so if, uh, let's uh, go off of YouTube and come back at um, 315 please.